Okay, so get, getting back to quantum mechanics again in the subatomic world, there, there was one feature that came out, I think, in the, in the early days that uh, Dr. Einstein wasn't so happy with. I think he called it spooky action at a distance. Quantum entanglement. Wh what is tank quantum entanglement? Yeah, so again, quantum mechanics is weird. It's the way the universe works, but many of its implications and um, realities are not what we would have expected. What it means is, to me, again, as a Christian, is whoever invented this universe is far more creative and, you know, got a lot bigger ideas than I would ever have, because I would never come up with quantum mechanics. So what happens is you can get um, a system set up. Let's just say it's two particles where these two particles um, are entangled. That is, the properties of one tell you what the property of the other is. Let's say that, you know, I have two pennies and, and I set it up so one is heads, the other one's tails. But again, in quantum mechanics, this one is neither heads nor tails. This one is neither heads nor tails. But I know that if this one is heads, this one has to be tails. And they're entangled because of one's heads, one's tails. What quantum entanglement says is, as long as I don't, in some sense, disturb the system, those two will remain entangled. I don't know if this one's heads or tails. In fact, it may be both. I don't know if this one's heads or tails. It may be both. But when this one is heads, this one must be tails. And with quantum entanglement, in theory, I could separate these two pennies across the distance of the visible universe and then I finally look at the one on my right and it's heads, which means the other one is forced to be tails immediately because they're entangled. And this actually works. We've actually, seen, and this is why Einstein calls it spooky action at a distance, because in theory, these things could be billions of miles away and they're both neither heads nor tails till I force one to become, to, to be measured and then it's heads. So the other one automatically becomes tails a billion miles away. Now, it turns out you can't send any information at that rate. And this is what um, Einstein's special theory of relativity says, that you can't send information faster than the speed of light. But think about, um, yeah, but, but they in some sense can continue to be entangled. And so what happens with one immediately affects the other. And this is shown to be actually true. How do we know this is a, you said, you, you said that we've seen it. How, how do you see it? Or how well, do we see haven't it? been able to separate particles billions of miles, right. but we've been able to separate them a macroscopic distance and do these experiments actually, and see that what happens with one immediately affects the other. So, uh, but do you, is there any way of understanding how they could influence each other? How the mechanism works, so to speak? Yes, because it's this wave particle duality in some sense. This guy over here is not a penny. He's some com weirdness of a wave and a penny and a wave can be over a long distance. And so it's the fact that their wave properties in some sense are still entangled that makes this particle property affect this particle property. Is that uh, part of some subatomic field of energy we're talking about? Um, uh, are we bringing back the ether again? No, it's, it's, the, it's the, the wave. So particles are described by waves, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really weird. A, a photon is a particle of light. Right. And every photon carries an energy. And the energy is, is proportional to its frequency. But frequency is a wave property. So I have an energy of a particle that's proportional to the frequency of the wave. It's, it's just that you can't separate waves and particles at the subatomic level. And this wave, um, if, it's, if it's a posi position, if it's a Schrodinger wave, it's a probability wave of a position or something. In fact, these waves are usually thought of as probability functions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, by some, um, again, whether or not the wave functions in quantum mechanics are real or mathematical is also a um, open debate.
but the, that wave describes these two particles and that wave has a spatial distance that covers the distance between the two particles. So are, you're saying in essence that uh, on our macroscopic leather, well, level, waves in the sea, baseballs, etc., it's one or the other, but it's a false dichotomy to ascribe that same sort of understanding to the subatomic level. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And in reality, it's even a false understanding to describe it in the macroscopic area. But the wave of a baseball is so small, you would never notice it. Yeah. I hope so. I, I had enough trouble hitting the curveball. I, I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I often joke that it's not the wave properties of the baseball that made me strike at the, the curveball, yeah. right? Yeah, made me swing at air. Yeah. Okay, so uh, getting, getting back to something you mentioned earlier, you mentioned the Higgs boson, uh, and, and congratulations to the whole team, of course, you especially, since you're the only one I know on the team, uh, for finding it. That's quite an achievement. What is a Higgs boson? So, um, yeah, there were 7,000 people on the two papers that discovered it. So if anything, I'm one seven thousandth of the discovery, but um, so... This standard model particle physics is a mathematical model and the mathematics describes the universe. And um, in the um, very bare bones model of the universe, fundamental particles like quarks and leptons that make up the universe don't have mass. And, but we know they do, but yet in the fundamental theory, they don't. So what Peter Higgs and, and Francois Englar and others did was they showed that if there was a field in nature, which we call the Higgs field now, that kind of permeated all of space, then that would um, interact with the fundamental particles to give them mass. So in particle physics, fields can become particles. In other words, there's an electric field. It's how one charged particle affects another charged particle. But we can also think of that not as a field between particle A and B, but as passing that basketball between particle A and B. So the field becomes a particle. And, and you can think then of the interaction between two objects as some field that permeates space like gravity or electricity, or you can think of it as the exchange of particles. Um, you quote, the, the terminology is you quantize the field. You make the field, which is um, homogeneous, into individual particles. A very bad analogy, but in some sense, we think of water as homogeneous, but what is it? It's made of particles. It's made of water molecules. So is water particles or is it some, you know, smooth field? And so um, when you quantize the Higgs field, you get the Higgs boson. Uh, the analogy that's given is how does it work? So in the 1980s, there was a competition to try to explain to the public the Higgs field and the Higgs boson. And the answer back then, Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. So the answer was the Higgs field is like a room of diplomats. They're the Higgs bosons or the Higgs fields. And when someone like me walks through the Higgs field, um, through the room full of diplomats, they're, you know, they don't care about me. So I can move from one end of the field to the punch bowl on the other end of the, the room with no interaction with the diplomats. But when Margaret Thatcher walks into the room, the diplomats swarm around her. Um, and so she moves very slowly through the room to get over to the punch bowl. As the, as the diplomats, which are the Higgs field, swarms around her, it, it forces her to move slowly, to have more mass, to be like molasses in that field. To me, I work, go through like it's nothing. And so as the Higgs bosons interact with Margaret Thatcher, as the field interacts with the matter particle, it gains mass. Where if the field doesn't interact with the matter particle, it doesn't gain mass. And this is all very mathematically precise, and it predicts exactly what we see in our experiments. In fact, it predicts it too well. We haven't seen any deviations from the standard model, uh, because everything that we see agrees with what the prediction about how this Higgs particle and Higgs field should interact. You, you talk about the uh... Margaret Thatcher moving through the room. Uh, I understand magnetism somewhat. I understand the strong nuclear force somewhat. How, how, what is attracting the diplomats to Margaret Thatcher? 
Good question. Is it the chicken and the egg or the egg and the chicken? So there is a, a rate, what we call a coupling, at how the Higgs field interacts with Margaret Thatcher. And that coupling is stronger for particles with mass. Mm -hmm. So the Higgs field likes to interact more with Margaret Thatcher than it does with me. Therefore, she has more mass. Um, where does that coupling come from? We don't know. But if we make a graph of the mass of a particle versus its coupling, how much it interacts with the Higgs field, it's a perfectly straight line. The more massive it is, the more it interacts with the Higgs field. Mm -hmm. um, it's linear, so it's a one-to-one. -one it's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's amazing. In fact, I could show you the plot. It's so perfect that we don't like it because we're looking for deviations. So it, it, uh, on your faculty website, it mentions that you're look, exploring now to see if there's a single uh, standard model Higgs boson or a family of Higgs bosons. How's it looking so far and what does that mean? <laughs> well, so far there's been no discovery of anything beyond the standard model and the standard model is one Higgs boson. We know we're missing something. There's dark matter, there's dark energy. The first person, so I always say we finished the one jigsaw puzzle of the standard model. But because of other things we see in the universe, we know that that jigsaw puzzle is really just a part of a bigger jigsaw puzzle or maybe another one. And the person who finds the first piece of the next jigsaw puzzle will win a Nobel Prize. That first piece could be another boson like the Higgs boson. So that is certainly one of the things that me and my graduate students are working on um, right now is looking for other particles like the Higgs boson that would give us a hint of what the next jigsaw puzzle is that we want to put together. All right, I'm gonna throw you a curveball here. Supersymmetry, are they, uh, is, it, is, it, is it complete? No, so supersymmetry is a model beyond the standard model. Uh, we, the, the terminology is BSM, beyond the standard model. There are things in nature that seem really finely tuned and there are things in nature that seem to be coincidences that are not easily explainable. And, and scientists don't like that. We don't like fine tuning in general, and we don't like things that are um, subtracting a million from a million of one because we need to get one is not the easiest way to get one. Um, and so um, supersymmetry is another theory that's been around a while that has the potential of solving many problems. I won't say problems, has the potential of making the mathematics much more elegant and solving problems in a natural way rather than in a contrived way, what some physicists would call contrived. It postulates that for every particle in nature, there is a partner particle that is yet to be discovered. Um, so for every electron, there's something we call the selectron. For every Higgs boson, there's something we call the Higgsino boson. And actually, it's not a boson, it's a fermion. What it is, there's two kinds of particles. Particles with integer spin, we call bosons, um, named after Satyanara, I think that was his first name. I forget his first name, but Bose. And then um, fermions, named after Enrico Fermi. And they have very different properties. And so what supersymmetry proposes is for every boson we know of in nature, there's a partner fermion we haven't discovered and vice versa. It's got so much promise to solve potential problems in physics that most people think it may likely be true, but it's been very evasive. We thought if supersymmetry was true, we would discover it immediately when we turned on the LHC in 2010 or by 2012, but we have yet to see any evidence for it. So um, if I was to you know, try to guess what is high probability of dis being discovered beyond the standard model in the next 10 or 20 years, supersymmetry would be high on the list as a viable theory, but so far there's no evidence for it. Okay, and to close in a gap for people who are watching, Satyendra post. Satyendra, thank you, yes. Had, I, I was had, close, I said something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as my son said to my wife one time when she was teaching, when she gave him an answer, he said, was that you or was that Google? <laughs> so I'll tell you that was Google. Yeah, good. Uh, okay, so we were talking about the uh, Higgs boson. Well, the first time I heard about it, it was on the news, and they called it the God particle. Why would they call it the God particle? Yeah, so in the 19, 
Um, late 80s, early 90s, the U.S. was building a super collider, which we ended up not finishing, unfortunately. And uh, a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist named Leon Letterman was, wrote a book in which he described why we were building this new super collider in Texas and what it was looking for. And one of the things it was looking for is the Higgs boson. And he needed a catchy title to sell books because his publisher said, as the story goes, I'm, I'm quoting rumors, if you call your book the search for the Higgs boson, nobody will buy it. But if you call it the God particle, it'll sell books. And so it was called the God particle. And there's a few lines in the book as to why, because this particle is so important and elusive, like God can be sometimes, that he called it the God particle. But as the rumor goes, it was really a marketing tool to try to sell books. There's not a physicist out there who calls it the God particle. We call it the Higgs boson, but the public knows it from that book, from Leon Letterman's book, um, as the God particle. That's how I heard about it. So, uh, yep. okay, well, you, well, interesting because in uh, in in conjunction with that, that when they announced on CNN that the the Higgs boson had been found, they asked their resident physicist. Uh, specifically, they said, does this disprove God or religion? He said, and more. So <laughs> does the Higgs boson disprove God or religion? I have no idea how it would disprove God or religion. Um, in fact, to me, it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, how did we infer that the Higgs boson was there? Because Peter Higgs and Francois Englert and some others did math. And the math said there should be a particle in nature because we believe the math describes the universe. If an engineer writes equations that describe how the structure of the building is going to stand various forces on it, then when you find that that math actually is part of reality, does that disprove the engineer? To me, it even proves more that there's a mind behind it. The, the fact that the Higgs boson is part of a comprehensible, and clearly design universe or the looks design. Many people will say it looks design. To me, it doesn't disprove God, um, but quite the opposite. It says if it looks design, maybe there is a designer. If it looks like mathematics can describe it, maybe there's a mathematician or an engineer behind it all. Um, I can't even begin to, dis to, to fathom why someone would say it disproves God. Uh, in fact, the more I have studied the universe and its complexity and its intricacy and its unusualness, the more it looks like there is a real designer behind it. Well, so, several years ago, I, uh, on a slightly different topic, I purchased a book called The Elegant Universe. Yeah. Uh, Super Strings, uh, Hidden Dimensions, and the Quest for the Ultimate Theory by Brian Greene which PBS then turned into a mini series explaining some of his theory. Uh, string theory, what, what, what is string? I thought, uh, I thought an electron was a little eight ball. Yeah, so um, the question that comes up is what are quarks and leptons made of? And um, we don't know the answer. We don't know, it's like peeling layers off an onion. If, as we peel layers off the onion, there's an atom and a nucleus and neutrons and protons and quarks inside those. Are they made of something or not? And one of the ideas is they're made of, the terminology uses vibrating strings of energy. And that, like a violin tune can be tuned to different frequencies and give different notes, these strings could be tuned and or wrapped in certain ways to actually create the different particles so that the underlying structure of the universe is these vibrating strings of energy. If I form them in one way, I get an electron. If I form them in another way, I get a Higgs boson. And that ultimately all reality is based on string theory. It's got a lot of promise like other theoretical theories. We don't have a theory that, um, we know that gravity is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity. And we know the small universe is described by quantum mechanics, but we don't have a theory that actually is coherent between quantum mechanics and general relativity. In other words, you don't have a coherent theory of gravity at very, very small scales. And string theory has the potential of solving that problem, for instance. So because of this, it's a highly viable and exciting theory. There's questions as to whether or not it makes any predictions that can actually be tested and so we don't know that. 
but um, and there's very few people who can actually do string theory. The mathematics is very challenging, I understand. But it's a theory, in fact, some people call it a theory of everything that would describe the, the that would be the underlying theory of how the universe works, um, being made up of these vibrating strings of energy. I guess the competitor would be quantum loop gravity? Well, there's other ideas about how to correlate gravity with, with um, quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum loop gravity, I think, is one of those. Um, I'm not an expert on these, so I'm not totally sure, but um, all these are possibilities. Um, and, and, you know, so part of the challenge is can you come up with an experiment that tells me um, which of these is the way the universe actually works? And right now we don't have experiments that we can do that would differentiate the various ideas. And who knows? Nature is always more bizarre than we actually think about. So maybe there's even a another idea, not string theory, not quantum loop gravity out there that is the real way in which nature, nature works and we just haven't found it yet. So in general, you've kind of hinted at this in a, in a previous questions, but do you see evidence for a mind behind the universe in the subatomic world? Do you see a design there? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And my answer is I totally do. Um, you know, the universe, Einstein, to paraphrase him, had to quote something like the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how in the world, and, and, and Wigner wrote, Eugene Wigner wrote a paper called um, something like... The unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Yeah, yes. the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical world or something like that, right? Why is it the math describes the universe? Um, and yet it's so... Um, Everything is so creative, it's so bizarre. Quantum mechanics is so different than the macroscopic world, but yet when you understand it, it's actually required for our existence. Um, aspects of quantum mechanics um, are necessary for us to exist. Even these strange things like quantum entanglement and stuff. Um, and so to me, the fact that it's comprehensible, the fact that it works so well, the fact that it looks designed. Um, just these are just physical reasons. There's other things, right? Where does personality come from? The atoms I'm made of have no personality, no morality. Where does morality come from? So there's philosophical questions since we have to get back to philosophy eventually. But I, you know, there's a famous quote, I think it's by Crick who discovered DNA that we have to keep reminding ourselves that it only appears to, to be designed. Wow. Well, if it appears to be designed, maybe it really is designed. And the more I study the universe, the more I see evidence for a mind behind it. Um, it looks too well designed. It correlates so well. It works too well. Um, to me, it's a leap of blind faith to say it just happened. Yeah. So we, we've been talking about physics and now I've asked you about the mind behind it. Could you, t can you tell us a little bit about your own religious beliefs? Yeah. So, um, I'm a, uh, traditional Christian, um, an Orthodox Christian, you might say, believing in the fundamental uh, truths of Christianity. I believe these things based, um, not on superstition, but like I do in my science on evidence. I think there is evidence, historical legal evidence that Jesus of Nazareth lived and died and rose again, which is, um, I, I think an actual resurrection is the only explanation for the historical evidence, for instance. And so um, I've come to the belief to, that there is sufficient reason to accept the tenets of traditional Christianity as being true, uh, not for emotional reasons or personal reasons, but for um, uh, evidential reasons, among others. Now, if something is true, it's going to have an emotional, uh, you know, ver reverberation or something. It's going to have. Uh, other consequences in life, and I think we see those within Christianity. But um, I think there's evidence that it's actually a, a true belief um, in who Jesus claimed to be and what he did while he was here. 
Okay, for a, a final question, do you see conflict between your scientific understanding of the world and your Christian faith? Um, absolutely not. I think historically there's been some tension. You know, everybody always points to the Galileo trial, which if you study it was more about politics than about religious beliefs, actually. I think there have been times when a poor understanding of either science or the Bible, the Christian Bible or the uh, Hebrew Bible have been um, misunderstood and therefore conflict. I think that's happening now. I think there are some Christians who interpret the story of creation in a way that I think is um, not a good understanding of what the Bible actually says and that therefore has a conflict with what science has shown clearly about the origin of the universe. We know the universe seemed to have a beginning about 14 billion years ago. And there are those who want to create a conflict between that scientific understanding and the account in Genesis by forcing Genesis to mean something it doesn't mean, that the universe was only created a few thousand years ago. So I think um, when there's been conflict, it's a poor understanding of um, the biblical text or of science, and, um, and when science has come to really show something as being valid beyond any reasonable doubt, um, I think in those cases, a clear understanding of the Bible has always correlated with that. Um, and so, no, in fact, I would say just the opposite. The more I've studied what the Bible actually says and not what people think it says, and the more I study um, nature, the more I see a um, compatible hand between the two. The same author who penned the Bible ultimately, I think, is the one who created the universe. Uh, I, have a, I often say this, I have a friend who's an artist, and he says, when you look at a piece of art, you see the soul of the artist. And as a scientist, I study God's piece of art, his creation. And everything I see um, and learn in studying nature um, tends to support what I actually read in the Bible. And I think the two actually build each other up into one coherent piece, one coherent whole. You know, like uh, Richard Dawkins said, when people discuss why the religious, he said they palpably, this is a quote, they palpably show that they don't know any science. I, I, I don't even have to ask you if he's right because you've demonstrated your scientific chops and your uh, sincere faith on the show. I, I want to thank you so much for being well, with can us. I Can I uh, remark about that, actually? Sure, absolutely. I, I, mean, I mean, I think it's because he has a misunderstanding of science, or he has a, a definition of science that by, by definition forces it to be incompatible with religion. If your definition of science is philosophical naturalism, that science says there is nothing beyond the natural world, that is science, then of course anybody who says they're religious is incompatible, um, palpably show that they don't understand science. But that's his definition of science, and it's a narrow definition of science. It precludes the possibility that there's something beyond the materialistic world. That's the worst way to do science. I mean, the worst way to find, well, let's say the worst way to find truth. The worst way to find truth in any realm is to set up preconditions as to where your evidence should lead. And if, the, if I set up a precondition that all the evidence must lead to a materialistic worldview, that is science, then I may find a truth within that worldview, but that truth is missing the reality of what the universe is. And so I think that's the reason I, I wanted to address that is because it's so common a misconception that if you study science, you have precluded God, but that's only true if your definition of science is that it can only explain the natural world and philosophical naturalism, that there is nothing beyond the natural world. So you're saying, and, yeah, I'm sorry, I will say, no, go ahead. You're saying they're conflating methodological naturalism with philosophical naturalism. To some degree, right. Um, but but if, if the goal of science is to understand the truth, and mostly it's going to be truth about the physical universe, because that's what I'm studying, the physical universe. But if there's something behind that physical universe, then I should in fact see some evidence of that mind behind it, 
within its creation. The way I look at a piece of art and can see something about the artist. The broad brush stroke shows that he was mad or passionate when he did this painting, right? And, and so I think it, it's actually the opposite. If there is a creator mind behind it, then the more I know about science, the more it's going to lead me to the truth of that mind behind it, as long as I haven't set up the preconditions that there is nothing beyond the physical world. And so this is so crucial because you'll hear scientists say this a lot. These are incompatible and it's incompatible because not because of their science, but because of their philosophical definition of what science is. Well, thanks very much, Mike. And I especially appreciate the scientific explanations of some difficult concepts and quantum mechanics. Uh, I think for most people who are going to see this show, uh, are not going to have a very good knowledge of, of beyond uh, electrons, protons, and neutrons, and they're going to be a little surprised to learn just what's going on these days. So I thank you very much for your knowledge and your faithfulness. Thank you for being on the show. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.